Now, government officials and security experts around the world are also closely watching the summit, of course, which is expected to impact discussions between North Korea and the United States. We turn to Dr. John Nelson Wright, a lecturer at the University of Cambridge and senior research fellow for Northeast Asia at Chatham House for his take on day one. And Dr. The two Korean leaders met today in the North Korean capital amongst a massive crowd of cheering citizens before starting in their first round of discussions. What do you largely expect to see from this historic Pyongyang summit this week? Well, I think, as your reporter was indicating, this is really a meeting about symbolism, um, continuity, and above all, maintaining the momentum of that historic first meeting back in April. Um, it's quite striking to me that the Blue House has if you like, being lowering expectations, I think, trying to move opinion away from the idea that this very important third meeting between North and South Korean leaders, the first, of course, taking place back in 2000, um, will, uh, will, won't actually deliver anything formal and concrete. Because I think the problem here, of course, is that the expectations of different parties are different. The United States wants progress on the issue of denuclearization. North Korea, we understand, wants a commitment to the ending of the war, a declaration of peace. I mean, it really isn't in President Moon's gift, I think, to deliver either of those two issues. So I think the most we can accept, expect in terms of formal agreements is maybe some positive language about lowering the risk of military conflict, um, measures perhaps to strengthen confidence building between the two Koreas, either in the DMZ or in the so-called Northern Limit Line in the West Sea. So efforts, I think, to build on that very positive relationship. And we saw, of course, very importantly, I think, genuine rapport between these two men who now, after all, have, have got used to doing business together. And that shouldn't be underestimated as a very important step forward. Right. Uh, any agreement or declaration made between the two Korean leaders will be undoubtedly heavily scrutinized down to the last detail. What do you hope to see this time around? Well. Let me begin by saying there are things that we shouldn't expect. We shouldn't expect to see a big expansion in economic relations between the two countries. Notwithstanding the fact that President Moon has taken a very significant high profile delegation of business leaders with him, the international environment, of course, is not conducive to the idea of close economic cooperation because of the importance of maintaining the sanctions regime. So I think it's probably best to expect that the most that this meeting will deliver is a reaffirmation of the commitment of both sides, both Korea's commitment to a peaceful relationship, both between the two Koreas and further afield within the region, and the expectation that building on a subsequent meeting between President Moon and President Trump on the margins of the UN General Assembly meeting later this month, there will be the hope that it will be possible to have a second meeting between Donald Trump uh, and Chairman Kim. So maybe some indication of a willingness to do that. But beyond those sorts of general declarations, I think concrete measures are likely to be hard to achieve. Right. So in order to uh, win international support, how specific should it be in terms of maybe phrasing or wording? Well, the world will be looking to see if those very bold and confident commitments of the April 27th Panmunjom John Declaration can really be uh, solidified. Um, so we will want to see an expression of intent not only to denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but some sort of indication, if possible, from Chairman Kim, that he is open to the idea of providing um, a, clear, a clear listing, if you like, of North Korea's nuclear capabilities, some indication that he will follow through on uh, delivering to Donald Trump what he promised. And um, on the part of South Korea, a willingness to emphasize that other countries, including the United States, need to show a willingness to commit to the idea of some form of peace declaration. The problem here, of course, is any form of peace declaration will have an impact on the US-South Korea alliance relationship. And conservative opinion in Washington is worried that too quick a rush to make such a peace declaration will undermine the strength and reliability of that bilateral alliance. And in the process, ironically, actually make peace less secure. And South Korean President Moon Jae-in said he will aim to uh, mediate and accelerate dialogue between Washington and Pyongyang. What would you say are the most crucial issues to tackle during this summit in order for denuclearization talks to advance to the next level? Two things I think are probably most obvious. One is a timetable, um, an indication of what comes next in terms of material steps that North Korea can take 
to both disclose the full extent of its nuclear arsenal and its capabilities, and a willingness to see some mechanism put in place to indicate its willingness to give up parts, if not all of that arsenal, over a graduated period of time. The second issue is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, a commitment by the United States um, that it is willing to sign up to the idea of some peace declaration and ultimately a peace treaty. The North Korean position has been that in that critical meeting between Chairman Kim and President Trump back on June 8th in Singapore, the Americans had given an assurance that they would be in fact willing to make such a commitment. The problem in all of this is the timing. The Americans, if you like, would like the North Koreans to move first in terms of a declaration of their nuclear capabilities and a clear timetable before they're willing to make such a clear declaration and commitment to a peace treaty, um, or at least a declaration that the war, the Korean War, is officially over. Um, I don't think the Americans at this stage are likely to embrace the idea of a simultaneous agreement. It may be the case that President Moon is trying to reach some understanding both with the North Koreans and with the Americans, who after all, he's positioned himself between both countries, if you like, as a mediator, some sort of willingness to bring the two sides closer together. That will take, I think, a great deal of diplomatic finesse, patience, and some degree of political astuteness. Um, so far, President Moon, I think, has shown that he has that capability. But of course, the situation is becoming increasingly more challenging as we get to grips with the real detail behind the, these negotiations. What about getting North Korea to uh, agree on submitting a list of uh, nuclear weapons in return for U.S. declaring a formal end of war between the two Koreas? Do you think the North Korean leader can be persuaded? Uh, getting inside the mind of Kim Jong-un, of course, is notoriously difficult. Um, we know, of course, that Jen Kim has made a clear commitment to uh, developing North Korea's economy. Uh, and he's already announced, of course, that uh, North Korea has, if you like, achieved realized its strategic objectives, uh, both in terms of its nuclear program and its missile testing regime. He, he has, of course, made it clear that uh, suspension of further tests, um, the effective end of missile testing by the dismantling of some of the North's missile testing facilities, all of that should be si seen as a sign of his good faith. But there's no doubt that he will need to do more to satisfy the Americans. The fact that Secretary of State Pompeo's visit was cancelled, I think, is a measure of how much um, uncertainty there is in Washington. Fear on the part of some American politicians that Donald Trump uh, may have been too optimistic, too keen to reach an agreement with the North Koreans. At the moment, of course, in all of this, domestic politics in the United States is a key factor to keep in mind. Looking ahead to the midterms, there isn't really much immediate need or urgency on the part of Donald Trump uh, to do anything except continue to do what he's been doing so far, which is to talk up the basis of uh, his talks with North Korea, to continue to present what's happened so far as a step in the right direction. I think it will be very symbolic and very important if the two Korean leaders do, in fact, as, as has been suggested, come forward at the end of their meeting and provide a joint press conference. That's the next stage where we can hope, perhaps, to see some sort of language that builds on the Panmunjom Declaration and, of course, on that Singapore summit. Um, but it will depend very much on the willingness on the part of Chairman Kim to take a risk and to begin to really open up his country. That will require not only a willingness to identify the extent of North Korea's nuclear weapons capabilities, its stockpiles of nuclear weapons, but also a willingness to see international inspectors and um, provide some form of assurance that North Korea's word can be taken at face value. All right, it's day one. It's hard to uh, suppress our expectations at this point. Dr. John Nelson-Wright of the University of Cambridge, thank you so much for your insights today. We appreciate it. My pleasure.